View Hotel, Cheltenham, in 1956. And the agenda shows that this was a mixture of AA service issues, sharing of experience, strength and hope, and socialising. It is reputed at this first convention the hotel management completely misunderstood the nature of an AA convention and ordered in massive supplies of alcohol, which were thankfully unused. Subsequent conventions took place in Harrogate, Buxton, and Butlin's Holiday Camp in Clacton. In England, Throughout the 50s and early 60s, the fellowship continued to grow, with groups recognising the need to share common experiences and resources. This brought about the development of intergroups, with Manchester the first registered. As a result of this development, the Group Representative Committee became the Area and Group Representative Committee and acquired the nickname of the Drunks Parliament. By 1966, a wholly representative service structure had been developed in the form of a general service conference of AA. This was held in the Midland Hotel Manchester in October of that year. The executive function of conference and its responsibilities was to be assumed by the General Service Board, which had been formed on the advice of the United States Foundation and was incorporated as a legal entity on the 16th of July, 1957. A major contributor to the work of the General Service Board came from a non-alcoholic member, Maurice Rena, a London barrister who proved to have a deep understanding of AA and gave much of his time to the legal complexities of developing the General Service Board. In the 1950s, Many members came to AA through the hospital service and on Friday the 21st of January 1955, eight former patients of Wallingham Park Hospital Croydon met in the Grosvenor Hotel Victoria Station and agreed to form the first hospital group. It was at this same hospital where Dr Max Glatt was a consultant psychiatrist and a great supporter of AA. His graphic portrayal of the illness of alcoholism clearly showed its progression towards rock bottom and recovery through abstinence. Another member of the medical profession who was a great friend and advocate of AA was Dr James Valentine of Scaleborough Park Hospital, Burley in Wharfdale. Dr Valentine served on the General Service Board as a non-alcoholic trustee of the fellowship from 1963 until 1991. Although sources reveal that support was given by AA to some prisons in the early 50s, evidence suggests the first prison AA group was opened in Wakefield Prison in 1958, sponsored by the Leeds Group. At the 9th Annual Convention, held at Butlin's Holiday Camp Clacton in 1964, a workshop on prison service attracted members from all over the country who were already sponsoring prisoners by sending them letters and literature and, where possible, visiting. This eventually led to the formation of Prison Intergroup, consisting of prison AA groups and those groups that had contact with prisoners throughout Great Britain. Further development in AA prison service came in 1972, when conference recommended that the General Service Board take responsibility for prison service. Intergroups, which had prisons within their respective geographical areas, now carried out the necessary 12th-step work. In Wales, the first group met on Friday the 13th of April 1951 at Cathedral Road in Cardiff. Present were five members, Sackville from Ireland, 
and four men from South Wales. Rex produced the first issue of a local newsletter for the group in December 1951. Yechi Da, Good Health, had a piece from Sackville who told the circumstances of his arrival at that first Welsh meeting. He had had a letter from Norman M and, as a result of a work-related appointment being changed from Liverpool to Newport, Sackville was able to set up a meeting with Norman, David Y and Archie P, who had sobered up in the Liverpool area. At the same time as Sackville visited Cardiff, several alcoholics in North Wales were struggling to achieve sobriety through correspondence. They were referred by London to a newly formed Liverpool group and began to attend meetings in Liverpool. By 1954, there was the nucleus of a group in North Wales who met in members' houses in Corwen, Bangor, and Llandidno. The original Cardiff group did not last, but there were stirrings in Swansea in the 1950s. Donald, a member from Hereford, visiting the Chem Coed Hospital group, met Alan D, who was being treated in a therapy group for dipsomaniacs. Alan got sober and drew in others from South Wales. Alan, incidentally, went on to be the first GSB member for Wales and Borders region. Cardiff established a new group in 1960, headed by Father John, an Irishman, who had great support from Sackville and Richard P. John was a well-known figure in Cardiff as he cycled around carrying the AA message, sometimes under very challenging and sad circumstances. This meeting in Cardiff was closely followed by groups opening at Caerleon and Abergavenny. Sackville and Richard P. stand as two people who carried the AA message in a country where, apart from the coastal roads, the majority of roads run east to west, the north-south roads being mountainous and little travelled in the 1950s. By the late 30s, the Oxford group was well established in Britain. One fully committed member was Lady Jean Dundas, wife of Sir Philip Dundas. Sir Philip, after serving for a number of years in the Black Watch, embarked on a farming career but became increasingly affected by his alcohol consumption and ultimately became desperate for help from whatever quarter. He became familiar with the group's beliefs and processes and by 1944 gave up drinking and found some kind of sobriety while managing his farm just outside Campbelltown on the Mull of Kintyre. Sir Philip inherited the baronetcy of Arniston, southeast of Edinburgh, on the death of his father in 1930. In 1947, he took himself to America to experience at first hand the work of the Oxford Group. By this time, the fellowship was firmly rooted in many cities and had adopted the 12 traditions at the first international convention in 1950. One of its early members, George R., had met Philip and introduced him to his first meeting, after which he toured America for some months, visiting a number of AA groups. He became converted to the fellowship and its new way of living and laid plans to carry the message when he returned to Scotland. In 1948, he did return and found great difficulty in contacting suffering alcoholics from the relative isolation of his farmhouse. However, he wrote to AA in London to discuss the dispatch of AA literature to Scotland. In late 49, Philip was involved in the organisation of a public meeting at the Centenix Hotel in Glasgow. From February 50, a group which met regularly every Tuesday registered itself in New York and was supported by such stalwarts as Jimmy R, Jack McKay and Jack R and came generally regarded as the start of AA in Scotland. Subsequently, John N of Ayr and Hugh B of Dundee joined the group before going on to start new groups in Ayr, Edinburgh, Dundee 
and Perth respectively. These and others were visited by Philip from his new home in Farrington Craig's Kelso. During 1950, Bill Wilson, his wife Lois, and Nell Wing, his secretary and the first AA archivist, visited Scotland. They were accompanied by Philip on a part of their schedule, which started at the Centenix meeting in Glasgow and continued at the meeting at Mucky's Restaurant in Edinburgh and on to Philip's home in the borders where Bill presented the Dundas family with a signed photograph. From there, they journeyed to Kilmarnock and Dunkeld, and at each, Bill left mementos such as signed photographs or signed copies of the traditions and the steps. Bill's visit provided a massive boost to the growth of AA in Scotland. In 1951, saw the publication of the first edition of Roundabout, with David B. of Air as its editor. Sadly, the magazine was not to be published again until 1955, under the editorship of John N. of Air, who was followed by Robert M. Dunfermline. Since that time, Roundabout has enjoyed uninterrupted publication. Again, during 1950, Philip toyed with the idea of some kind of service structure for AA in Scotland, in which he would handle general correspondence with Jimmy M, Mimi R and Robert T acting as contacts in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dunfermline respectively. The plan never came to fruition, but they did organise the first Scottish intergroup meeting, the handwritten minutes of which are housed in the Scottish Archive collection. From an early stage, the Blue Bonnets gathering featured prominently in AA life in Scotland. The first convention was held in Dumfries in 1954 and was organised by Tom T of Birmingham, Tom G of Manchester and Sam R of Dumfries. The latter had started a meeting in his hometown in 1952. In that same year, the Blair Gowrie Group was founded at the Royal Hotel but moved later to Cooper Angus, where Alex had bought the Strathmore Hotel. Thanks largely to the efforts of Robert T, the first Scottish convention was organised at the Dunblane Hydro in 1957. This highly successful event has subsequently been staged at different venues and become a fixture in the AA calendar. As a consequence of a burst appendix, Philip died an untimely death on the 23rd of February 1952. Since then, the links between AA and his family have remained strong. Philip's grave is in Melrose, in his beloved border country. His family retain an admiration for his often lonely struggle against alcoholism as a somewhat remote member of the Oxford group and respect his contribution to the early development of the fellowship. He, as well as the others mentioned in this account, and any who may have been omitted, went to great lengths to assimilate the programme and to carry its message in Scotland. They were true pioneers. Under the care of a god of our own understanding, the growth of AA has continued in Britain since that momentous day in March 1947. Our gratitude goes to all those who in the past have gone to great lengths to carry the AA message, enabling all who followed in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous to recover from alcoholism in unity through service. They may have passed on, but their legacy lives on today in the archives of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it has been with AA. By faith and by work, we have been able to build upon the lessons of an incredible experience. As I look out across this crowd, there floats back to me a mighty assurance and this is a mighty assurance 
for AA's future. That indeed, it will go on for so long as God wants us. So I can only say, may God bless and keep you and Alcoholics Anonymous forever. This has been an attempt to recreate the past in a meaningful manner for the present. If anything has been overlooked or appears to you to be incorrect, please let us know. <laughs>